demand. By popular demand, I've been there three times already since May. People have been asking to announce that. So please um, go to eastwest.com and you can read about it and join me at East West tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll be lecturing in East West on Monday, I guess, apparently. Um, so I'll be lecturing almost every day around the Bay Area doing this little tour. And uh, I will also be doing the skin clinics. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that's about, it's really important because that's the easiest way to help people avoid skin cancer, prevent skin cancer, and uh, even treat the initial phases. And uh, I cannot say without getting some doctors very angry, but maybe even more advanced conditions could be addressed as well. But definitely, uh, it's always so nice to see people telling me how they feel that they look so much better and so much younger when all the skin lesions on their face disappeared uh, to the point where you cannot even tell that they were there. And in many difficult cases where nobody would want to remove them because they touch the eyeballs, they're on the conjunctiva on the inside of the eyelid, those type of skin lesions that nobody would remove, including cancers that, some that already have been treated and failed and came back. And now they don't want to cut I even more and expose the eyeballs or on the ears or the, or the nose or inside the nostril. It's just a, such a great and easy way to help people. Um, and every time I come to the Bay Area, I'm glad to help at least a few hundred people avoid surgery. It's that, that effective. And so do you want to say something to this effect? My name is Arthur Hamilton. I'm a massage therapist. I work in Cupertino and in San Francisco and in, uh, also in Walnut Creek. And Jane has invited me here um, to the seminar one night. She said, you have to come, you have to come. I had a, um, what do you call it, a basal cell sarcoma. It was about this big, and I was afraid to go to a doctor because I knew what they would probably do to try and operate on it. And Jane says, you have to come and see Dr. T. He can heal this for you because he's healed Jim Cease who also had about 15 lesions on his face, which Dr. Teal, he was healing at that time. And so um, he said uh, it, he did his little magic on it, and within four weeks, uh, the, the body of it fell off, and then there was this little fuzz, and three days later, that little fuzz came off, and I you have no, you can't, you take a real close look at my skin, you can't see that I had a, a skin cancer this big on it. Bleeding, it was bleeding. And so it was just a miracle. And uh, also, there was a, one of our clinic, uh, Audrey Smith at our clinic, she had all these warts all over her face. She said, I have five warts. Do you think Dr. T can fix them? And it made her look like a little bit like the Wicked Witch of the West, right? Her face is completely clear. She looks 10, 15 years younger. And uh, she would be here tonight except for a couple of events. She wasn't able to make it. But she's very, very, very happy with Dr. T. Thanks. So you don't have to wait until things get advanced. Just uh, prevent them. If you even have a little rough spot on your nose, it could be already the beginning of something. One of the magic things about coming to this group is you have, you meet people and you like the maggots, but I met Dr. T here. I met, I'm, I met Dr. I met Dr. T here and, and I, I had uh, uh, some, on my nose, I had something cut off. So pay attention. I had something, I had a, a, a growth that was cut off and Dr. T, about three different times, he did his magic, and he always picks a picture of my nose, and he says, you are so pretty. <laughs> yeah, and you know when he talked about the magnets? And I was thinking, boy, you know, we saw the how she jumped out of bed and had absolutely no arthritis, and I was thinking, gosh, if I had maggots in my bed, I would <laughs> jump out of bed really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'd like to uh, invite our next speaker, Christine, doc uh, sorry, Dr. Elise, sorry. Yeah. Here it is. And Thank you. Okay. So I'm a techno idiot. Excuse me if I make mistakes pushing the buttons. Okay. We're going to start. This is called the pharmacy. In other words, we're getting back to real food here. Um, and I believe that that's what we need to do to get better. Supplements are great, but they alone do not heal and will not get to full, you will not get to full health just popping pills because pills cannot do what food does. Food science is very, very new. We're in its infancy. 
and we keep on discovering new things. So what about all those things in the food that we don't know about yet? If you take that pill, you're missing out on all of those unknown factors, let alone the biophotons that are in all the food that provide uh, more than just the fats, the carbohydrates, the minerals, the vitamins. We need the energy from food. And so we're going to talk about that right now. Um, this is actually a long presentation. I'm only going to do part of it. Um, we're going to go over the uh, liver detoxification and the kidney and the digestive support of this part of the presentation. Um, and the rest will be available at another time, I guess. So first of all, the human body has evolved over millions of years interdependently with plant plants and animals. And to think that we could do better than nature, make food out of, in a lab, just seems ludicrous to me. And like Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. Source matters. In other words, you want organic food that has been well uh, grown in nutritious soil that has been balanced. Um, you won't get, there, there have been studies done, non-organic food can have as much as 70% less nutrients. In the 1940s, a serving of uh, green beans should have provided the RDA of zinc, which is 11 to 15 milligrams. Nowadays, you're lucky if it provides one, if you're buying conventional. So you, you know, you have to be careful about your source. Um, 40 years ago, in the last 40 years, 30% of our arable soil has disappeared. It's eroded. And we only uh, replace the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium in conventional food. In other words, in conventional farming. In other words, where's the zinc? Where's the boron? Where's the chromium? Most of the f uh, soil in this country is chromium deficient. You need chromium to help your pancreas do its job. So th again, this is one of the reasons why we are malnourished in America. Even if you eat good food, you have to make sure, even if you eat your five a day. By the way, the five a day in fruits and vegetables in America, I'm a Canadian. In Canada, the government says 11 fruits and vegetables a day is what's going to keep you healthy. So just consider that. So it's very, uh, very critical that um, the soil in which your food is grown is healthy. And the reason is we're missing out on all of our minerals. Without minerals, our enzymes don't function. We have more than 20,000 cellular enzymes. One third are zinc dependent, one third are magnesium dependent, and the rest are a mix of uh, other minerals. And if you don't get those minerals from your food because they're not in the soil, you're not going to have them for your enzymes. And what will happen is that your body will start to catch on and use the heavy metals, which are abundant in the environment and therefore abundant in your body, to replace what should have been zinc. And the mineral and the enzymes will work at a much lower level. And the more enzymes that get polluted with these heavy metals, the less well your, en your cellular enzymes would work. I'm not talking about digestive enzymes here. I'm talking about cellular metabolism. And so as your cellular metabolism decreases because you're not getting at the right minerals, everything else starts decreasing. Like Dr. T was saying, you don't, ooh, I have to be careful about how I hold that. If you don't have your mitochondria working properly, your glutathione production goes down. Your cellular metabolism is flat, and you need these minerals for cellular metabolism. So if you think that you're going to be different than our environment without making an effort to do so, you're mistaken. There's a hundred times more mercury in the air now than there was a hundred years ago. The water around us is pretty much polluted. It has the MTBE from our uh, gasoline. It has everything leaching into it. Um, we're pretty naive to think that if we just eat well, um, we're going to be healthy unless we also 
do differently than what our water's like. If you're drinking, you, you wouldn't normally see that sort of dirty water, but our water systems were designed to kill microbes at the turn of the 1900s. They were all built for that purpose. They were not built for the purpose of taking out chemotherapy drugs, which people are urinating into the toilets, or, or the rest of the pharmaceuticals, or the rest of the pesticides, or insecticides that are covering our planet now. We were not, we were first not designed to even deal with those with our body, but they're all in our water and they're invisible. And if you think that they're not in you because they're invisible, it's a little bit of folly. So the average child in America has more than 200 different man-made chemicals in the umbilical cord. Is there any wonder why our children are ill? They haven't even started off healthy. So what do we do about this? Well, you stop the source of toxins and you input the healthy organic food. You stop the source of toxins such as alcohol, sugar, in particular high fructose corn syrup, obviously. Fruit sugar is fine if you're eating real fruit, okay? Not fructose powder that you put into something. <laughs> um, reduce the caffeine. Tattoos are toxic. They're made with heavy metals. They contribute to that enzyme dysfunction and all those toxic chemicals. In Europe, there's more than a thousand different chemicals that are put in the American cosmetics, 1,021 about five years ago, that are banned in Europe, but that we have in our cosmetics. So you have to really think carefully. Most women put five pounds of plasticizers and crap on their body a year, and it also gets showered out into our drinking water again. Because our water, there's very little actually potable water on this planet, and we're recycling our potable water all the time. So we input healthy organic foods, and you eat, by my standards, you eat only what your great-grandmother would recognize as food, okay? She doesn't recognize a Twinkie, for instance, all right? Eat only foods with five ingredients or less. That's an arbitrary number, but in other words, if there's a list this big of ingredients in your bread, put it back on the shelf. It's not bread. Eat only foods with ingredients that you can pronounce, <laughs> okay? If it's a long word that sounds like a chemical, it wasn't meant to be in your stomach. And shop on the perimeter of the store where the fresh food is found. Eat foods that will decompose. If they're, if they're marketing foods, your tomato's gonna last 21 days. God, put it in the, in the garbage. Don't buy it to start with. And buy foods from vendors who specialize in food and only food. Don't buy food at a gas station because you're not gonna get real food there, okay? Then you're, in order for your body to actually utilize food, you also have to be detoxing all the crap that's in your body because you live in this environment and you have to do something other than just eating to detox. Uh, like eating as your, maybe your sister or your mother ate. We need to upregulate our detox functions in my book. Um, many, many people are quote unquote liverish. They have all sorts of signs of poor liver function. So the next section of this presentation is some of the really good general detox foods. And those include chlorella. And chlorella, for instance, is the, according to Dietrich Klinghart, the most studied food in the world, af and even more so than garlic. But it's all in Mandarin and ch some sort of Chinese, Taiwanese, and Korean. We just don't have access to that information. It's very, very high in all sorts of minerals. It's a complete food. It has protein in it. It's obvious, you, but you, very, the most important thing about chlorella that you need to know in my books is it, it is a great binder of heavy metals and it helps to clean the body. It also cleaned the water that it was grown in. If you didn't have a good source of water, if you weren't growing it in pristine conditions. Years ago, uh, there was a real sort of like everybody was into the, the 
spirulina, blue-green algae from Klamath Lake, and something just always told me to stay away. Well, it drains all of the cattle industry's um, debris, and it goes into Klamath Lake, the last place in the world you'd want to grow, eat a, a, a seaweed or an algae or a chlorella from is from that water because the plants will actually clean the water and hold on to these substances, and then you're going to eat them. So you have to have a very, very clean source, and that's the most important thing I'd say about chlorella. And you can eat lots of it. You have to be prepared for a potential detox reaction. It also, according to the American Cancer Society, has anti-cancer properties, uh, anti-tumor and immune-enhancing properties. It sort of goes on and on. It's a superfood. Next is cilantro, which is called Chinese parsley. It's widely used in ethnic cuisines. I suggest that my clients um, make a cilantro tea that they drink daily and that they buy a bunch of cilantro and eat it as much as they can. I mean, like, many bunches a week. <laughs> Just add it to your salads. Um, it's been shown in by Japanese researchers to be to massively liberate heavy metals. Um, it's very, very high in vitamin A and also has vitamin K, which is necessary for mineral transport. You can take all the minerals you like, but you don't want them stuck in your blood vessels. You have to transport them with vitamin K. If you're not eating a diet with uh, scratch chicken eggs, in other words, free-range chicken eggs, um, and other foods that are high in vitamin K, you're going you're gonna to get your minerals in you, like the 1,200 milligrams of calcium that are recommended by the regular doctors for women. And now we're seeing all sorts of cardiovascular disease because you just took a whole bunch of calcium, but there was no way to transport it to where it needed to go in the bones. So cilantro is one of the superfoods for many reasons. Next, um, to upregulate detox function, organic whey. Again, you want to make sure it's very pure because it's a concentrate. Anything that concentrate is a concentration of the wrong, the, the, the toxins also. Cows live in this world too. They're animals like us, or we are animals like they, and so they also have a toxic burden to deal with. So you need to make sure that their whey is from grass-fed uh, cows and that it has been treated properly and not overly heated, for instance. It's very high in glutamic acid, which is, of course, important for digestive health. And like Dr. Um, Tel Oren was just saying, this isn't, I'm not talking about colostrum here, but colostrum from these same healthy animals can also heal the gut. Next, acai berries, but that's just an example of berries. Really, uh, the, the darker and richer the food, the higher they are in the polyphenols and the antioxidants and those um, biochemicals that you need for the detoxification process and for your brain and everything else. It's not like any one process in your body, um, you know, sequesters or utilizes all of one nutrient. We need these nutrients for the whole body to function. And then watercress is one of the cruciferous vegetables, and it can be eaten raw, which has a cooling nature, so it helps to deal with inflammation. A lot of the greens are very cooling in Ayurvedic medicine and in Chinese medicine. And it helps to also remove stagnation in the blood. You need to get your blood flowing to cleanse and to do and to transport food and nutrients where you want them transported. Mung beans are also have a cooling nature, and they're very detoxifying for the liver, gallbladder, and kidneys. They also contain all the minerals you need for detoxification. You can sprout them if you want them raw, or you cook them. Um, and they're very high in fiber. They're 61% fiber, mostly soluble fiber, so they're going to clean your arteries up. And so that's a list of some of the really important detox foods. Now we're going to get into specific liver gallbladder um, foods to support liver gallbladder function. Um, it is the largest organ, the liver is, after the skin in the body. It's huge. People don't realize it. You have 
this whole area of your body is liver. It's massive. And, um, and it can be con come congested due to our environment and with the consumption of alcohol and sugar. High fructose corn syrup is deadly to, it's like alcohol to the liver. Nicotine, drugs, and chemicals, everything is processed through the liver. So it has a lot of work to do and you want to be gentle with it. You want to ease its load because just living is enough of a load for it. So lemons are great the, for the liver. You've heard of, you know, olive oil, lemon, gall, uh, garlic flushes. I don't actually recommend those flushes at all because so many people's livers are, so many people just can get very, very sick on them. It may be possible to do them at the very end of a, a whole healing process, but certainly not at the beginning. Uh, um, lemons are antimicrobial. D they destroy putrefaction in the gut. They increase immune, immune function, obviously, vitamin C. They act as a s gentle diuretic also. Um, and I, you know, as I said, this could go on and on. It also, vitamin C is critical for cartilage, skin. So um, lemon is lemon water, everybody. It's a real easy one. It makes water taste good. These are my selenium nuts, I call them, not Brazil nuts, because you have five of them a day and you have your selenium needs met for the day. And it's in a natural form, bioavailable form. You just need to make sure you chew them very well. And selenium is critical for the detox function. Beets. That is actually my prescription for almost all of my clients, one beet a day. Cooked. Um, grated, in a salad, pickled, I don't care, one beet a day. Um, they're great for blood cleansing. Look at the bright red color. Um, a unique source of phytonutrients um, that help with, th uh, that are anti-inflammatory and detoxification. Um, they're called betalanes, but we don't need to, and they support especially phase two detoxification, which involves glutathione and glutathione transferase. And that's usually the phase that gets clogged up. So eating beets is an easy, natural way to upregulate your phase two of your detox. Beet greens are also an excellent source of lutein. Many people throw out the greens. Don't but you don't want to be eating too much of them. There's oxalic acid in them. Some people are sensitive to that. So like Dr. Tellorin was saying, it's vari it's you don't want to overdo anything, um, eat too much of one thing all at one time, or focus on just a few foods at a time. As you'll see, there's a lot of variety in this presentation. Um, now, this is maybe a controversial one, but remember when we all used to have liver once a week? Well, in homeopathy, like heals like, if you can get at some good livers. And I recommend chicken livers for that reason, because chickens don't live very long. They don't live long enough to get toxic. And you can get some pretty good chicken liver, actually. They're very high in protein, which is critical, critical for glutathione production. Um, they're high, ver that's where you get your B12 and your B vitamins. It's one of the best sources of folate, bioavailable folic acid, in other words. And vitamin A um, has 56,000 units of vitamin A in a 100 gram serving. So it's huge. And it's hard to get those sort of concentrations of copper, phosphorus, zinc, selenium, protein, uh, riboflavin, vitamin A, B12, B vitamins in other f in vegetables. So for people who are really uh, 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 who are ma seriously malnourished and are wasting, who have wasting diseases, this is a good option. Then of course we have whoops. Okay, hold on. Okay, get out of there. Oh God, how to do that? I pulled up a dictionary. Oh, thank you. 
Okay, the onion family, very high in sulfur, which is critical for detoxification. Flavonoids, it has anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties. Excellent, not just for the liver, but for the bones, the blood, the heart, and for sugar balance. Um, then the artichoke. Artichoke extract is being used as a medicine by natural paths. You could also just do prevention and eat a lot of them. They help to get bile flowing. Bile flo you're, you're, it's through the bile that you're able to detox. You du the bile dumps into the jejunum, this first part of the small intestine. And if you have binders there, the, the toxins in the bile will get bound and then carried out with your bowel movements. And the more bile you can produce and cleanse and, and bind the toxins out of, the faster you will detox. And it also has chemicals that reduce nausea, vomiting, and intestinal spasms. Um, the next one is turmeric. We've all heard of turmeric. It's a um, pharmacological agent that people talk about is curcumin. But really, it, you don't want to take a curcumin supplement. You want to take, every herb has a plethora, uh, hundreds of different chemicals in it that work synergistically. And you need that synergy for them to work optimally for you and to not potentially cause problems. Because when you get a concentrate like a pharmaceutical, you can do a concentrate of an herb too. Pharmaceuticals, 50% of them come from herbs. So you really want to eat an herb in its whole state. and. You, curcumin, turmeric is the basis of curry. Eat a curry twice a week. It's, an, it has, it's really a superfood. It's anti-cancer, anti-ulcerative. Uh, um, it also intensifies, excuse me, um, the anti-cancer properties of other foods you're eating, which is interesting. It, it has been shown to inhibit precancerous colon lesions. Um, and it reduces C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. It aids liver de detoxification by upregulating glutathione, about 40%. It lowers LDL cholesterol. It helps break down amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease. And Sorry, said that. It also is also DNA protective due to its high vitamin A and beta carotene um, components. It also modulates nitric acid, which means that it helps to, reg to relax the blood vessels, hopefully preventing high blood pressure and dealing with vascular issues. It has massive antioxidant properties, so it does like a triple quadruple whammy. Olives, I consider them a superfood. They're one of the most alkalizing proteins around, have anti-inflammatory, and they have a, the ORAC um, values are not being considered anymore, but olives have huge amount of antioxidants in them for their weight. You know, for they, they're very concentrated in antioxidants, and my prescription is 10 a day. Bitter greens are, absolutely critical for health, and notice I used the word bitter. Bitter is not found in the American diet very much. When you add all the flavors to your diet, to, your, to a meal, you feel much more satiated. If you don't have bitters and in your meal, there's like, you still have food cravings. It's like we, in America, we eat salt and sugar, but what about sour? and bitter and astringent. When we have all those in our food, in one plate, we've, we get a sense of satiation without eating a huge amount. These also, uh, the bitters also offer, um, are high in sulfur, antioxidants, and other anti-inflammatory factors, as well as anti-cancer, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, and the some of the chemicals in the bitters also bind to the bile acids to carry toxins out of the body. So these are like healing foods. Need to make sure that um, you don't, that the cruciferous greens you cook because uncooked cruciferous are goitrogens. 
they're bad, they, they do damage to the thyroid gland. So you want to always steam and cook your cruciferous vegetables. They can even be lightly steamed and it makes a difference. Then green apples, if anyone knows the Gerson protocol, he's big into the green apples for the liver. Helps, uh, they're cooling in nature, green, cooling, red, hot, you know, and have high antioxidant values. And they help, uh, green apples, according to Pritchard, also help get the flow of liquids going in your body. Again, movement is critical. You can't feed your baby toe if you don't have blood going to it. You know, if you don't have good circulation. We're going to talk about the kidneys next. The kidneys act like a sieve, uh, filtering the blood of uh, the minerals that you don't want in your body and pulling the minerals back into circulation that you want into the body. Um, but of course, if you're not eating real food from good soil, you don't have any minerals, you know? So it's tends to get clogged up with heavy metals very easily. Uh, and like the uh, doctrine of signatures, it the kidney bean looks like a uh, kidney, and it actually is very beneficial for the kidney. It acts as a diuretic. It's very alkalizing and very high in trace minerals. Again, you hear me talking about minerals all the time. Um, so. And adzuki beans in Chinese medicine are particularly good for alkalizing the kidneys and relieving kidney, the kidneys get very stressed if you are super acidic. In fact, if you're super acidic, your body will start dumping ammonia into your urine so that you don't burn yourself all the way through. And when you have a urine test and it goes up into the very high alkaline um, range, in my books, that's not, that's, that's because you had ammonia dumped and you were really in the really, really acidic range. And your body, to preserve your whole urinary tract, went and, and less made your urine less acidic. So we want to alkalize the urine. For most of us in this Western world, we're very acidic. So it helps by alkalizing, you help to detox. It's also, azuki beans are... 67% fiber. They're also high, very high in the B vitamins like the mung beans. And there's 17 grams of protein in only 100 uh, grams of adzuki beans. These can also be sprouted. Cucumber. Lovely, cooling, um, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, antioxidant, diuretic. Uh, it purifies the skin in addition. Um, I have a lot of my patients with uh, kidney problems juicing cucumbers and celery and beets to flush things out of their bodies. And of course, um, another way of doing cucumber is cucumber watercress soup, for instance. That's a great combination. Next is watermelon. You've all heard of watermelon seeds of being a diuretic. Well, watermelon's also very, it's nice and cooling for all that inflammation going on. Faster. Okay. Um, it's thirst quenching. It has nice bright colors. You know when there's bright colors, your, pla your plate should be a variety of colors. And you've got a good plate going. Cranberries prevent bacterium from sticking to the urinary tract. They're not bacteria, bacterial cidal themselves, okay? Um, and asparagus is an amazing anti-cancer and uh, alkalizing agent for the kidneys. I'm going fast, so I'm going to go through them. Parsley, parsley tea just like cilantro tea. Add parsley to all your salads. Herbs are super concentrated vegetables, put it that way. We're going to go through the digestive system really quickly. I'm, I have five minutes? No. Two. Okay. There we go. I'm, gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to let you look at the pictures, okay? Um, you need to cook the cruciferous, okay? Uh, the fiber in the cruciferous helps to bind the bile acids. Prunes. 
I like to say four a day, four or five a day. Um, and it decreases transit time. That's very important. You shouldn't have what was in you 72 hours. You shouldn't still have it in you 72 hours later. Okra, great mucilogenic uh, food, anything that makes that sort of sticky, gooey stuff is excellent for the colon in particular. It's massively anti-inflammatory and helps with colitis and ulcers. Um, it also strengthens the capillaries in Chinese medicine and it helps to control blood sugar. Rhubarb, you never eat the leaves. They're toxic because they're so high in oxalic acid. You eat the stalks though. They're used as uh, medicine in Chinese medicine. And uh, they can, it can act as a mild laxative for the colon. Chia seeds, again, providing the, the mucilage that's healthy for the colon, and very high in protein, 20% protein. And soluble fiber, 11 grams of soluble fiber in a regular serving. Sta it also, all these mucilogenic foods help to stabilize blood sugar, part of the digestive process. And also very high in EFAs. They are composed 60% of essential fatty acids. Noni is not normally one you just eat, but you could take in pill form, and it's an amazing food for the gut. I've seen a lot of people heal using noni. It is a sister to Indian mulberry, which is massively high in vitamin C. Aloe vera, uh, Christine talked about that, and I'm going to talk about bone broth soup. Bone broths is, are very critical for the healing of the gut. They can be, um, they have to be made appropriately. You can't use one of those little Knox cubes. They have to be real bone broth. And um, there's a whole autism and related disease uh, protocols called the GAPS diet that uses bone broth as the basis for healing the gut and for healing the brain. Ginger, obviously, it's a great thing to drink after tea, uh, tea after a meal. Anti-nausea, anti-vomiting, prevents cold sweats. Great, it's a great carminative, uh, helps with elimination and gas. Black pepper stimulates the uh, appetite. Nato, I won't even, natto, I won't even talk about, but I'm going to mention here the uh, fermented foods, but like Dr. T was saying, I see people eating like massive amounts of them. You don't, real fermented foods are so much more potent than probiotics, you don't need a lot of them with a meal. But I do recommend for people who are rebuilding their guts that they use uh, pr these um, fermented foods. I'm talking about teaspoons with a meal not cups of probiotics. Kvass is a Russian um, drink and traditionally made with rye bread, but also made with beets. I like the beet kvass, obviously. And we're almost done, kombucha. Now, that kombucha, if I buy one of those, it lasts a whole two weeks. It's a little bit that I dilute with more water. You don't drink a whole kombucha at a time, and they're ha those are really sweet to boot. You don't need, you don't want to be putting something so sweet in you. Kimchi and sauerkraut, and that's it. Thank you, Dr. Liz. Um, I just uh, wanted to uh, again thank both the uh, talk le lecturers today. It was very nice. Uh, to hear different opinions. Um, I want to uh, give you a little bit, uh, as Anna requested, Anna requested about the, the salt, what's special about it. And I will just get straight to the chase because there's not much time left. We have to finish in five minutes and then uh, get ready to leave. We have to be out of here by 10 o'clock. So sulfation and methylation are two crucial portions of the detoxification process especially um, in the liver, we have phase two and phase one, but phase two is more important and often the more sluggish phase of detoxification 
without which we cannot possibly have a healthy process of clearing out toxins that are initially fat soluble, like our own hormones, like our neurotransmitters. So the body utilizes sulfur in, in this process, and that's why it's called sulfation. But um, people don't realize that methylation, which is a different detoxification process, is uh, crucial for the utilization of sulfur as well. Because if you know that sulfur is in glutathione, in alpha-lipoic acid, in N-acetylcysteine, um, sulfur is a part of glutathione. And in order for us to recycle glutathione, we need methylation. Methylation, therefore, is some kind of a parent process that allows sulfation to take place. And sulfation is a process that allows methylation to take place. They're both important for one another, and most of us are insufficient in our sulfur intake today because the environment is so polluted, so many heavy metals that are using up our sulfur capacity, our sulfur-bearing enzymes, which are binding those heavy metals. Therefore, most of us are not going to get enough sulfur in our onions and our garlic. People don't eat enough of them to give us all the sulfur we need. And people are not eating enough crucifers, uh, like cabbage and uh, cauliflower and broccoli, which also contain sulfur. But because of hybridization today, they contain a lot less sulfur than they once did. So we have no choice but to rely on other sources of sulfur. And that's why people go and buy MSM. And I'm not saying a bad word about MSM. However, it's another supplement. And people don't want to take too many supplements if they can avoid them. They want to get their nutrient in their food first and, for all, uh, first and foremost. So the salt is a great source of sulfur and it's the only type of, of salt in the world that contains a huge amount of sulfur it's between four and a half thousand and six and a half thousand parts per million of sulfur. So then you would ask why this salt? And it's not just because of the children that it supports. I built a factory in Kathmandu that is owned by the Everest Learning Academy, the, the network of schools and child care centers and orphanages we talked about earlier. But beyond that, it's the only one that comes from a factory that is dedicated to nothing but this salt. So when, when you grind the, the crystal, the black crystals from which this derives, if you use a machine that also grinds other foods and other salts, there might be contaminants or allergens. Also, if you use machines that are painted, and most of the machines contain paint that have inside them quite a lot of heavy metals, and especially lead, I have tested those in a reputable, famous laboratory and measured the amount of heavy metals. And most of the other salts that I tested that come from India and Pakistan had a very high amount of lead and other, other heavy metals because of probably the corrosion of the paint from the actual production. There are other reasons which are all listed in an article about the salt that uh, Anna has given away. Maybe there are a few more of that article. You're invited to take that article and read about it. Then you understand the benefits of having that type of salt. I use it regularly in my diet now. It's a great source of uh, sulfur. It protects me, but you also have to remember methylation. And there are a few things that people do regularly that disturb their methylation process. One of them is animal protein. The more animal protein you eat, because of the high level of methionine, which is not a good source of sulfur, you can get lots of sulfur from methionine, which comes from eggs and fish and poultry, chicken and so forth. You get the sulfur, but you get it from methionine. And whenever you get too much methionine, you uh, increase your level of, ho of homocysteine, which is toxic and unhealthy, and you disturb your methylation. Methylation goes down dramatically when you eat uh, more than five days a week of any animal flesh, and when you eat every time more than one meal a day, even the size of one fist. That's already enough to, to damage your methylation because of too much methionine. So those are not healthy natural sources for, um, for sulfur. You want to go to 
the sulfur that is cleaner, that does not come from methionine. That's just in a short uh, nutshell. If you have any interest in seeing me for skin lesion, talk to Anna or email Anna, which is colteranna at aol.com. Colter, C-O-U-L-T-E-R, Anna, A-N-N-A, uh, at gmail.com. Uh, sorry, at aol.com. Just uh, if you want to have her schedule your skin appointments because uh, I will do it in the next nine days all around the Bay Area. And I will look forward to seeing you at our special benefit festival to help the children. So thank you in advance for coming and we are done. <laughs> <laughs>